Good morning and welcome, and thank you for joining us for the next installment of the Franzic Monthly Webinar Series. I'm Scott Metcalf, and today I'm joined by my partner, Kendra Yoke, and we are going to present the 2019 Legislative Update. Um, what, what's going to happen today is that we are going to give you a quick overview of some of the most interesting and important pieces of legislation, but it's far and away not a complete list of all the legislation. We'll be sending that out to our um, FR alert distribution list in uh, the near future. Um, but for those of you who are not familiar with Franzic PC, we are a law firm of approximately 30 attorneys who focus on labor and employment and education law. Before we get started, there's just a few housekeeping matters that I want to address. First, uh, right under the presentation slides, you have the ability to type and submit questions. Please feel free to ask questions throughout the program by using this feature. Um, we'll try to get all, to all of the questions, but we have a lot to cover today, so if we can't get to those questions <coughs> during this half an hour, we'll definitely follow up with you afterwards. Um, second, everyone logged into today's program will receive an email that includes a link to the recording of the webinar as well as the presentation. So let's, without further ado, let's just go ahead and get started. Uh, today's agenda has five items on it, and I'll actually call it five and a half items, because our agenda has student <coughs> issues, curriculum issues, employment issues, finance and pension issues, and property tax issues. And the 5.5 .5 issue is going to be school business operations. Uh, but that's what we're going to try to cover today. And uh, the first thing we're going to get to talk about is just the, the student issues in general. And uh, Kendra, I know that there's been a lot of uh, legislation, so why don't you start out by telling us what is generally going on with the legislation affecting students this year? Absolutely. Thanks, Scott. So first, I want to mention a couple bills that impact post-graduation preparation for students. Uh, the first one is Public Act 101-290, and this one requires that school counselors discuss all post-secondary options with students when they're creating a uh, post-secondary education plan. So that's going to include uh, college and university, as well as community college and vocational school. So really looking at that full continuum of different uh, post-graduation options that students may want to get prepared for. Uh, the second one that impacts post-graduation preparation is Public Act uh, 101-180, and that one requires students to complete the FAFSA form in order to graduate. Uh, this, again, is to encourage students to uh, look at their options for after high school and get a better understanding of what uh, financial aid might be available to them. Uh, there is an exception, uh, a couple exceptions. For instance, parents and students can submit a waiver that the State Board of Education will make available, stating that they know what the FAFSA is and they're choosing not to file an application. Uh, two other ones that I think are a particular note for schools now uh, is first the one impacting school calendars and student attendance. So remember that uh, last year the five-hour seat requirement was omitted from the law, which created a lot of, um, a little bit of confusion, as well as some opportunities for flexibility for schools when they are planning for student instruction. Uh, so now we have that requirement is reinstated, uh, but some of the flexibility is maintained. Uh, so there are some exceptions to the five-hour requirement, including for students who are enrolled in dual credit courses, who are participating in a supervised career development program, participating in an apprenticeship, or participating in a blended learning program. Uh, this law also provides for two parent-teacher conference days uh, and authorizes students to use e-learning. So that's another thing that we saw a lot of last year, uh, especially when we had weather days, was using e-learning so that students could continue with their studies and then not have to add days on at the end of the school year. So there are a few requirements uh, with respect to e-learning days. Uh, and that includes that the e-learning or instruction is still going to be for five clock hours, and that there's a non-electronic option available for students who don't have access to that kind of technology at home. Uh, the second really big uh, new bill that has become law covers questioning of students by a school resource officer, uh, a law enforcement officer, 
or other school security personnel when at school, when they are suspected of committing a criminal act. Uh, this is for minors. Uh, requirements include ensuring that the student parent or guardian is notified regarding the fact that the student has been detained and is, being, is going to be questioned, uh, and, or at least an attempt to contact the parent or guardian. Uh, we also need to document that that attempt was made, including how the attempt was made and when, uh, and then making reasonable efforts so that the parent or guardian can actually be present for the questioning. And if that's not possible, having a school uh, mental health professional like the social worker, psychologist, nurse, or guidance counselor uh, present for the questioning. Uh, finally, we're looking for the law enforcement officer who is doing the questioning to have training in safe interactions and communications with youth. Um, and this, as uh, many of you know, is in response to a very tragic incident uh, a while back where a student did commit suicide after being questioned by uh, an officer at school. Um, and so this is looking to uh, make sure the parents are aware when that's happening and that it's done in a way that um, is safe for students. Yeah, Kendra, I know that this is a, a big issue and it, it definitely makes some significant changes in how school resource officers may be used by some districts. So um, if there are questions about this, um, feel free to reach out to us um, and, and talk, to, talk to your attorney about how, how to properly use school resource officers under this new law. Um, another big issue, Kendra, has been medication of students. It seems like every year there's a, a, ever more um, legislation affecting how students can be given medication. Can you tell us about uh, what some of the new, new legislation is on that topic? Sure. There's been a ton of it this year. And let me just flag for you two things. One is with the school resource officer questioning, going back to that, uh, we'll be putting out a bulletin with some question and answers to clarify some of the nuances of how that's going to be implemented. So keep an eye out for that. And then with respect to medication, if you check on our um, Special Education Insights blog, uh, we have these as well as one other new law summarized for you there with a little bit more detail. But I'll outline that for you here. The first uh, really expands how uh, students can self-administer medication at school. So you're aware that uh, in the past, the law has provided for students to self-administer asthma medication as well as EpiPens if they have the proper plans and prescription and um, uh, authorization from their parents. This really expands beyond that to provide for uh, self-administration when it's called for under the student's individual health care action plan, uh, food allergy emergency action plan, uh, the 504 plan, or an IEP. Uh, something to note here is that the school needs to make sure that that emergency action plan provides for what to do if the student is unable to self-administer. So what's the backup plan? And then when do we need to call 911? So we want to make sure that all of our plans where students are self-administering medication include those two components. Uh, the next one is the Seizure Smart School Act. And this really sets up guidelines uh, and requirements for schools to have a seizure action plan for students that is a lot like the plans we have uh, for students with diabetes. Uh, so parents are going to provide instructions from their doctor, and the school will have a plan for how to support the student at school, uh, which includes having a delegated care aid that supports the students um, at school with whatever uh, medication or other uh, supports might be needed. Uh, this does allow the student to carry uh, medication and supplies that might be needed if it's provided for in the plan and requires all school employees to have training on the basics of seizure recognition and first aid and emergency response uh, protocols. Uh, another one that you've probably heard about is an update to Ashley's Law. Uh, as you may recall, Ashley's Law allows for the administration of medical cannabis-infused products for a student. Uh, when that student has, um, uh, is registered uh, for that type of medication. Previously, the parent or a registered caregiver had to come to school to administer that medication and then take the medication off of school grounds after um, that med medication was administered. With this new law, which will be in effect in 2020, the school nurse or an administrator is able to administer that medication if they have received the training that will be made available by ISBE. 
and the medication can be stored at school um, the way other medication is securely stored. Uh, students are not able to self-carry medical uh, cannabis products at school. Uh, one more that I do want to flag for you that's not here is Public Act 101-428, and that's an update to the Care of Students with Diabetes Act. Uh, this provides that the school can have an undesignated store of glucagon, uh, and the nurse or delegated care aide can administer that uh, if the student's glucagon is not available or is expired. And this is just an emergency protocol. Um, students with low blood sugar, glucagon can be a life-saving uh, medication. Uh, and so having an undesignated store would allow the nurse or that delegated care aide to provide that to students if theirs is not available. So how about special education, Kendra? All right, special ed, also a big one um, with a lot of new updates, and we'll have some more updates on our blog as well with some additional details. Uh, but I'll flag for you here. Uh, one is some changes to the procedure to withdraw from a joint agreement. Um, so the changes are really, number one, that the notice needs to be provided at least 12 months uh, from the date of proposed withdrawal. It used to be 18 months was the requirement. Uh, the process has also changed a little bit in that if the petition for withdrawal is not approved by the other member districts, uh, the district needs to provide notice to all parents of students with disabilities residing in the district of the intent to withdraw and hold a public hearing to allow any interested party the opportunity to review their plan for educating students after withdrawal. Uh, withdrawing districts is always have to put um, develop a comprehensive plan demonstrating their ability to provide education for a wide range of students with disabilities and have a, a full continuum of support services. Uh, the second one to note is uh, requiring that ISBE adopt rules to establish the criteria, standards, and competencies of bilingual language interpreters at IEP meetings. Um, so as you know, uh, IDEA provides that parents who uh, need uh, language interpreters be provided that so that they can participate in an IEP meeting. Uh, and this law will require ISB to develop some standards for exactly uh, what is required of those people so that uh, it's done effectively. Uh, then, of course, the big one is House Bill 3586. And we've been watching this one for a while. Uh, it was signed by the governor on Friday. Uh, there has been some confusion about exactly what it's meant to do and how it was drafted. Uh, we may see some changes coming up in the veto session, and so we'll have our eye out for that as well as any guidance from ISBE and make sure that you are aware of any new developments. But for now, it creates a lot of new procedural requirements with respect to special education. The first one that's really important to note is that any written material that the team plans to review at the IEP meeting. It needs to be provided to the parent no later than three school days prior to the meeting. So that's going to include all of your evaluations, any data that's been collected, and a draft of the IEP. Um, exceptions to that would be if it's an initial eligibility, you don't need to provide a draft IEP. And uh, for any IEP meeting, you don't need to include a draft of the service minutes or the placement page, because obviously those need to be determined at the table after a thorough discussion. Uh, we would recommend that you make sure all of these documents are marked draft and really come to the table you know, prepared to talk about them so that you don't have uh, parents claiming that things have been predetermined. Um, you know, getting all this information out to parents ahead of the meeting can be a challenge, uh, but hopefully it will also make your meetings more productive and maybe even a little bit quicker. Uh, the second requirement is that related service providers need to be keeping related service logs uh, and that those are student records that need to be available to parents at the IT meeting or upon request. Uh, and the district needs to let parents know about the existence of these related service logs. Uh, related to that is that if the IP services are not being implemented for whatever reason, um, within 10 days, 10 school days, after that IEP or after they're supposed to be provided, the parent needs to be provided notice of that. And that notice also it needs to include uh, an in, uh, a notice that parents can request compensatory services for the services that have been missed. Uh, finally, the last big one is response to intervention. 
And as you know, response to intervention or um, MTSS is something that you guys have in place already with respect to determining eligibility for a specific learning disability. Um, that's always been, or not always, but has been a requirement for many years now. Uh, this does not limit your ability to do additional testing when you are uh, looking at eligibility under the category of special, uh, specific learning disability. What it does do is say that you are allowed to use uh, RTI or MTSS data when determining eligibility for other categories of disability, and it requires that parents participate in this intervention stage. Um, and so that may be new for a lot of districts who really did that RTI or MTSS process internally, that now parents need to be involved in that uh, decision-making process and review of uh, the progress. Uh, there are also a couple of specific requirements for CPS related to their um, procedural manual um, and notice that they need to give to parents. Um, but overall, you know, that's, that's our new special ed bill that is going to require some planning uh, on the part of districts to really get that implemented. It is um, effective immediately. Wow, that's a lot of information, Kendra. We probably <laughs> need to move on to, uh, to curriculum, though. And curriculum, to me, always seems like uh, it holds a mirror up to what's going on in society, and, uh, and this year is no exception, is it? Yeah, you're exactly right. Um, so the things that we've passed this year, uh, number one is Public Act 101-227. And this requires that textbooks purchase with funding from the State Board of Education not discriminate on the basis of any characteristics under the Illinois Human Rights Act. Uh, many of you are familiar with the Illinois Human Rights Act and it protects from discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, national origin, citizenship status, ancestry, age, physical or mental disability, arrest records, military status, sexual orientation. It's very comprehensive. Um, so that's with respect to the books themselves. Uh, additionally, these books need to include information about the roles and contributions of all people protected under the uh, Illinois Human Rights Act. And so that's really um, going to make sure that the curriculum is expanded to include the contributions of a diverse array of people. Additionally, uh, it requires that history courses include a study of the roles and contributions of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people in the history of the country and the state. Um, Public Act 101-245, and this one is targeted at 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, and requires that there's at least one semester of civics education focused on government institutions, discussion of current and societal issues, service learning, and stimulations of the democratic process. And so this really you know, is aiming to get kids involved early in understanding how government works and how they can participate in that process as well. I, I think it's really interesting that they've actually included simulations of the democratic process um, to get kind of more active learning there. Uh, finally, we've got House Bill uh, 3550, which has been signed, and so it's now Public Act 101-579. And this mandates that sex education courses in grades 6 through 12 uh, include age-appropriate discussions of the meeting of consent and recognizing what constitutes and does not constitute consent. And there's a whole list of information in the, in the law itself about what does and does not constitute consent. Uh, so this is obviously an important addition to that sex education course that's provided uh, in middle and in high school. You know, Kendra, I've heard a lot in the news about the, um, the teacher shortage in Illinois, and then I think also everyone knows that the 6% end-of-career salary cap has been reinstored. So there's probably a lot of other things going on with employment legislation, but maybe you could fill us in on those two things as well. Absolutely. So we've got a couple uh, laws related to employment here. Uh, the first one deals with the minimum teacher salary, and you're right, there's been a lot of press on this. This increases the full-time teacher salary to a minimum of $40,000 uh, in the year 2023 to 2024, and there's sort of a step between next year and 2023-2024 to get to that $40,000. 
so that is a big change for many districts, uh, which will uh, boost the salaries of teachers, and I think you know is really aimed at uh, helping to address the teacher shortage. Uh, the second one is Public Act 101-72, and this has to do with uh, when you have a substitute teacher who may be teaching in multiple districts, and the regional superintendent is responsible for doing the criminal history records check, as well as the check of the statewide sex offender and murder and violent offender against youth databases. Uh, which are obviously critical parts of that pre-employment process, and sharing that information with ISBE uh, so that uh, it can be available to other districts who may be looking to employ, employ that same substitute teacher. And finally, and this is a, a big one here for student teachers and that process to becoming a teacher, and that eliminates the requirement of the test of basic skills. Uh, there's been a lot of press about that and uh, the low passage rate. I think I read that the passage rate for the test of basic skills were low, was lower than uh, the passage rate for the bar exam. <laughs> so that has now been eliminated. And uh, it also allows that student teachers can be paid. Uh, and so hopefully eliminating a barrier to some people who might uh, be considering uh, the path to becoming a teacher, uh, that that part of your experience can include compensation. Well, you know, it's just been very recently that we completely overhauled the uh, financing of education in the state of Illinois. But uh, what happened with finances and pensions this year, Kendra? You are right. So with respect to the budget this year, uh, the appropriations for elementary and secondary education uh, have increased by $375 million. And the appropriations bill also provides for special education reimbursement at $80.5 million. Um, the other two laws that are included here both address the teacher shortage and speak to uh, a limited way that teachers who have retired can be reemployed uh, with certain conditions without impacting uh, their retirement status. And so there are specific requirements for both Chicago and for outside of Chicago, uh, but that really is focused on uh, allowing retired teachers to come and fill some of the gaps that districts may be experiencing. Well, I'm going to okay, take Okay, and now, <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I just, I got so excited about property taxes that I just had to jump in there, Kendra. Sorry about that. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> um, no, I mean, the big, the big thing in property taxes this year um, is probably going to be the property tax relief task force. Yet another task force has been formed, and they need to report uh, basically by the end of this year. But this time the focus will be on uh, the racial and economic impacts of, of the property tax system. And we'll see what that report has to say when it comes out. But in terms of the day-to-day -day operations that may affect school districts, I think one of the one thing that should be on your radar screen is that TIF information, tax increment financing district information will now be required to be on all tax bills throughout the state of Illinois. Um, so the tax bill will contain a list of each TIF district in which the property is located, as well as the dollar amount of tax due that is allocable to the TIF district. This has always been a big issue for school districts because TIF districts are like a hidden tax increase uh, where the school districts are not getting the revenue, but it appears that they are getting the revenue from the tax bill. So this is a good first step toward transparency in the area, uh, but we still need to be able to educate homeowners outside of the TIF district who aren't getting those special tax bills where the money is actually going. A second bill is interesting because of the number of school districts that own property that are leased to individuals that have to pay property taxes. Um, so you have a property that you're not using and you're leasing it and someone has to pay property taxes. What happens if they fail to pay those property taxes? Well, this Public Act 101-198, um, it only affects property in a county with more than 800,000 inhabitants and less than 1 million inhabitants. I haven't quite figured out which county that is yet, but when I do, I will let you know. Um, in, those, in that uh, county or those counties, 
What will happen if the lessee fails to pay the property taxes is that uh, the county treasurer will notify the taxing district, in this case in our scenario, a school district, and then the state's attorney can bring a lawsuit against the lessee compelling them and entering a judgment forcing them to pay the property taxes. Finally, um, there's a bill that was quite uh, a political hot potato uh, because it changed the way that uh, some assessing officials outside of Cook County will uh, get or retain their jobs. Basically, um, in, in any county other than Cook, a county board can adopt an ordinance or voters can pass a referendum switching from an elected to an appointed assessing official or vice versa. And this applies to um, any assessing official that's elected. So that would be either township or supervisor, countywide supervisors of assessments. So that is everything that's pretty much going on of note in the property tax field. But there are some other things I wanted to mention quickly in relation to school business as well. The first one has to do with the working cash fund, which has been the subject of a great deal of attention and litigation over the past several years because of how uh, working cash funds, uh, especially bond proceeds that were deposited into the working cash funds, were, were transferred out and later used for different purposes. This, uh, this bill, Public Act uh, 101-416, is actually just a technical cleanup of the working cash fund article of the school code. And what it does is it adds evidence-based funding to the formula for the maximum amount of any working working cash fund bonds, and it adds anticipation of evidence-based funding as a reason to lend money from the working cash fund to another fund. So it's a cleanup that basically brings the working cash fund uh, article of the school code in line with the new funding source under, um, under the evidence-based funding model. There's also been a change to the lowest responsible bidder statute. Um, in the 10 years that I've been looking at legislation, this uh, statute has only expanded the number of exemptions, and this year is no exception. Uh, so the, this year the amendment is uh, in the section that, regards, that formerly regarded the purchase of natural gas. Uh, from the competitive bidding requirements. So previously, the exception was for purchases of natural gas only when the cost is less than that offered by a public utility. Now, under the new law, the exception says that you are not required to bid um, it, even if the price is above the public utility, and if you are going out to get diesel, gasoline, oil, aviation fuel for some reason, natural gas, propane, lubricants, or other petroleum products. So basically, any sort of fuel source is now exempt from the bidding requirements. Also, uh, the Freedom of Information Act has been amended. Um, you know, previously, I think a lot of school districts were redacting things such as credit card numbers, debit card numbers, bank accounts, and such. But that redaction fit uncomfortably within the exemption for personal information. Now it's perfectly explicitly clear that there is a, an, an explicit exception to the FOIA disclosure requirements for credit card numbers, debit card numbers, federal employer ID numbers, security code numbers, passwords, or anything else that could be used to, um, to commit identity theft against the taxing agency. Uh, finally, there's something that, I, that jumped out at me that I wanted to mention because automatic contract renewal provisions are something that is always affecting our clients. This is the situation where you have a, a one-year contract and there's a provision that says it automatically renews unless you send in a cancellation notice uh, between 11.55 and 12 a.m. on May 31st. Um, and, and then if you don't send in the cancellation notice on time, you're stuck with that contract for another year. Well, this year the Illinois General Assembly has added school districts to the list of entities and individuals that are covered by the what's known as the Automatic Contract Renewal Act. And what the Automatic Contract Renewal Act says is that if some company is going to do this, they have to clearly and conspicuously disclose the automatic renewal provision in their contract, and they also have to send you notice of the pending renewal between 30 and 60 days before the cancellation deadline. 
And if they don't do that, it's a violation of the Consumer Fraud and Deceptive, Deceptive Business Practices Act, which can either be enforced by the Illinois Attorney General or by the individual who is harmed by the action of that entity. So uh, I think we have almost used up all of our time, haven't we, Kendra? Mm -hmm. I think we have. That was kind of a whirlwind. There was a lot of new legislation this year. Uh, as far as questions, I know we're about out of time. I see one about whether ISBE has issued guidance related to the SRO law. Uh, not yet. Um, as of right now, uh, we have not seen that, but we will keep our eye out. Transit will be putting out some guidance, a Q&A on that in the next day or so, so keep your eye out because we do have some additional information on that particular law. Uh, so, thank you very much for joining us today. We hope you found today's program helpful. The next webinar in our series will be on September 24th, if you want to mark your calendar. We'll be discussing homebound and hospital instruction. We're also hosting a webinar next week on Wednesday related to student residency and homelessness. That will be a more in-depth webinar that will be a full hour looking at those issues. Uh, additionally, you'll receive an email today with a link to this program's recording and presentation and a link to register for our upcoming webinars. Thank you very much and have a great day.